give you a very high level overview of that work today. Um, I just want to ask my colleague Alan Klein to say hello. Alan, are you in Zoom land? I am, yes. Hi, everyone. Hi. It's a pleasure to see you all again. Um, I'm from the Bay Area and still live there full time. I'm currently in Colorado for the pandemic, though. It's been such a pleasure to get to work with so many organizations. I love um, doing this research with Wolf Brown now that I don't get to spend all day with Theater Bay Area. Um, and I'll be over here in the chat. Um, and if you come up with any questions as Alan Brown is talking, feel free to put them there. I'll answer some of them and I'll direct some of them to Alan Brown as well. So feel free to not sit on things. We'll keep things active over in the chat. Right. Thank you, Alan. Um, so I just, uh, so many wonderful um, names and faces on this call. I wish I had time to greet every one of you, but I don't. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna just dive in. I'm gonna share my screen and um, kind of dive into uh, the results. So um, <clears throat> uh, for those of you who are already familiar with the study, I, I apologize. I'm gonna give a little overview for those on the call who are not familiar with the study. Uh, just to kind of set the um, set things up. So back in March, when COVID hit and close downs happened, and we were in the throes of um, figuring out what to do, um, it occurred to me that we would need a mechanism for hearing for, from audiences about how they feel about coming back. Of course, at the time, we had no idea what you know what the epidemiology would look like, uh, but um, <clears throat> After an unsuccessful attempt at getting funding from a big national foundation, I just decided that we really needed to kind of go, go it um, without sort of a centralized funder. And, and I think in retrospect, that worked out really well. Um, so in the first phase of research, which wrapped up in December, we had 22 partners like Theater Bay Area, most of those partners were regionally organized uh, and you can see the cities there, uh, several cohorts in New York, um, two cohorts also in Los Angeles and other cities. There's either a service organization or a local foundation funder behind each of those cohorts um, or both. Um, and then we had a couple of disciplinary cohorts, a big cohort of performing arts centers and I'll be sharing some of their data with you today just because it's the best sort of cross national cross section we have. There's about 30 to 35 performing arts centers in that cohort and they were deploying the survey twice a month. So we had really great time series data. Um, <clears throat> a small cohort of orchestras and then a couple of international cohorts, which is really helpful. Uh, because the COVID situation obviously was so different in other countries, especially Australia and Norway, uh, that we were able to welcome them into the survey. Um, and and F, you know, FYI, back in March, I called up Sunil Iyengar at the National Endowment for the Arts, said, Sunil, you know, don't, got an idea for an audience study. And he said, great, Alan, apply for a grant and we'll let you know in nine months. <laughs> Uh, and in Australia, our, we have a wonderful research partner there, Tandy Williams. Her firm is called Pattern Makers. And she had a commitment from the Australia Council in five days for national deployment of the survey. So that's just a different, uh, different situation in different countries. But that gives you a sense of the scope of the study. Um, the methodology was very simple, is that all of the participating organizations in all of the cohorts which amounted to almost 600 individual organizations um, sent out email requests to their to samples of their patrons asking for cooperation with the survey. So in most markets, we did a deduping exercise so that people would only get one invitation. And the way people manage their list, most patrons only got one request to take the survey. Uh, so we weren't pestering them. Uh, but unlike all other research, there's no written deliverables here. All of the data goes into the dashboard. 
is instantly available as soon as it's in the dashboard to all of our cohorts and their participating organizations. So the learning really happened in the context of the dashboard and the webinars that we've had on a regular basis with participating organizations in each cohort to really make sense of the results. Um, so, so that in a nutshell uh, is, is the study. The protocol itself, because this is a time series study, we were able to evolve the, the questioning. You know, initially when we were designing this back in April, everyone was talking about sort of health safety procedures at venues. So we had a kind of a deep dive into that topic early on. Um, and then the COVID situation changed. There was a lot more emphasis on digital programming. So we did a very deep dive of questioning into digital demand for digital programming and related topics. And then more recently, uh, a third major revision of the protocol um, really opened the door to asking about vaccination, attitudes about vaccination um, and continued uh, probing into digital. So. Just to give you a sense, the protocol will change. We've already um, designed the protocol for the next phase. I'll talk a little about that at the end. Um, so let's get into some high level indicators of demand. Um, and the first thing to say is, is just contextual information. I'm showing you here results for the National Performing Arts Center cohort and you can see that they have 12 uh, data collections oh, for stretching from May to January, just uh, two mm -hmm. weeks ago. Um, and we asked people if they are vulnerable to a serious health outcome, if they catch COVID, someone in their household is vulnerable as a serious vulnerability. And nearly 50% of all of our respondents really consistently across all of our cohorts said that they are vulnerable to a serious health outcome. And this is important because this factor really drives so many other um, uh, patterns in the data in terms of people's level of caution and readiness to go out. People with a, a health vulnerability are just much more cautious about going out as you would expect. Um, so I just wanted to kind of um, establish that. Um, we began back in August asking people about the sort of their perceptions of infection rates in their area. Um, and it turned out this was a really um, interesting sort of leading indicator uh, because back in the summer, back in September, things were getting much better, at least in some areas. And you can see here the percentages of people who, who, who believe that the infection rates are decreasing in their community went way up. So there was more optimism, um, you know, and what, what was so confounding to us and that we've talked about extensively in past sessions is, is sort of the, the difference between people who believe in, in uh, conditions are imp improving versus people who believe conditions are worsening, even though they live in the same area and presumably have access to the same information and just how different those two camps are in terms of their readiness to go out again and everything. So that really led us into thinking a lot about sort of irrational responses or beliefs based on the same information. Um, but so you can see here, things obviously got much worse when the big surge hit in November and December. And nationally, at least with the Performing Arts Center aggregate, we're starting to see a turnaround, at least people believing things are stabilizing. I mean, still people, most people believe things are getting worse. This is the picture for the Bay Area. We have um, just three um, data points here uh, from August, September, and November. Um, and you can just see the, the extraordinary turnaround. You, I don't need to explain mm -hmm. that to you. You're all living through that um, <clears throat> in terms of, of worsening conditions. Uh, I'm happy to hear that things might be opening up a bit out there. Um, we asked people their comfort level attending a range of different types of cultural facilities, um, assuming they were open and following guidelines for distancing and mask wearing and the comfort level with large venues just really didn't change much. 
uh, for eight months, um, much to our chagrin. Um, and you know, generally our whole experience with the first phase, we set up this elaborate system to detect trends and change and actually not much change. Hmm. Um, so uh, I think it's interesting to compare this mm -hmm. to um, figures for museums, which we'll see in just a second, but this is sort of a regional picture. Your figures for the Bay Area here are the fourth, are in the fourth column where the little arrow is. Very low comfort level. Uh, this was as of November 16th. Little, things were a little better in some of the Midwestern markets like Cincinnati. Uh, we saw it's just sort of generally higher wow. levels of interest in going out sooner. Um, we can't really pin that on any one factor. Um, although in our minds, of course, we're, we're um, thinking about um, red states and blue states. Um, we, we did not ask people about their political um, beliefs and we just, we just didn't want to get into that in this study, but, but right. clearly that's in the background here. And you can see the figures for Australia on the right. So mm -hmm. I just spoke with our partner in Australia a couple nights ago. They just had like several days where there were no new COVID cases in the whole country. Wow. Amazing. And their, um, their venues are still not open <laughs> fully. And they're still mandating masks uh, and distancing, and they have no new COVID cases. <laughs> so I just thought that's an interesting data point. Um, here's the data, uh, same question for just how comfortable are you walking around museums? And just you know, categorically higher uh, levels of comfort in spaces where people can control their proximity to other people. Um, and you know, still kind of around average, people are a lot of people are not yet comfortable, even in museums. But it's just categorically more comfort than large performing arts venues, uh, which I don't think is a surprise to any of you. We also uh, questioned around size of venue or seat count, and if that um, had an effect on people's perceptions of safety. And the, and the answer is yes, a little. Uh, people were more comfortable in smaller spaces, or at least with fewer people. Uh, that was pretty clearly communicated to us. Uh, and it was even more pronounced uh, in Australia. Um, so I just wanted to paint a picture. There's some differences here in, um, in terms of venue size and type of venue. This is the very big picture. Again, the National Performing Arts Center cohort results, um, conditions for return. And what's interesting here is the yellow bars on the bottom of this chart show the percentage of people who say they're ready to go out as soon as it's legally allowed. And that reached, you know, that was going up over the late summer. It got up to 27% uh, on this cross section of performing arts centers. Of course, there were big regional variations. This group of performing arts centers includes some in Florida, you know, Orlando, Tampa, as well as Texas and other cities. Um, so it's quite a diverse cohort, but you can see what happened in, you know, as, as news of the vaccines came out, started coming out in November, and then the rollout of the vaccines, and we started learning about the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines and how efficacious they are and how safe they are, the percentages of people saying they were waiting for a vaccine just went up. Uh, and this was the case really in all of our markets. Um, but interestingly, the percentage of people who said they're ready to go out now actually stayed, stayed consistent. And what happened is people moved out of those middle cohorts of say, I'm waiting for treatment options or, um, um, or uh, I'm waiting just for the levels of infection to drop naturally, which just isn't gonna happen in our country, unfortunately. So this was the very big picture. This was the picture for the Bay Area of the same question. You know, generally on the coasts, we saw just more caution 
you know, New York was early traumatized uh, by COVID and we just saw an order of magnitude more caution uh, in our New York cohorts. And similarly, uh, it happened a little later, similarly in Los Angeles and San Francisco, where we just had, you know, almost half of everyone saying, I'm wait, I'm not going out until I'm vaccinated. Um, and notably here in San Francisco, we had just a very small percentage of people who said that they're ready to go out now or as soon as legally permitted. Um, so just generally higher levels of caution compared to other places. And on a positive note, you know, we've been asking people that, you know, once, once they feel comfortable going out again, will their spending be higher or lower or the same? And, you know, the, the, the really good news here is that is that 90% plus say their spending will be the same or more. And actually in this sample, we actually saw a bump up in the percentages of people who said, I'm gonna spend more than I used to. Um, and I'm just sensing just in the last sort of month or so um, through open-ended comments, just, just the feeling of people getting very anxious and eager to go out again, um, more, so, more so than before. Uh, so that's a, that's, let's keep that in mind that, you know, our market, you know, notwithstanding all the sources of caution, all the reasons people won't go out, that they, they actually want to go out and they want to spend as much or more than they used to, um, if we can figure out how to make that happen. Um, so moving on, we also explore digital content in, in quite some, um, detail, I can only share uh, bits of it with you now, uh, but overall, um, we saw about uh, a quarter of everyone saying digital content's really not for me. Um, and, and one of the sort of interesting byproducts of all this research on digital was just people articulating exactly how much they value live experiences. Um, we have just overwhelming amount of, of, of comments and open-ended questions about just how much people value the live experience. So that being said, we had another sort of quarter of people saying, yes, I'm actively looking for digital programs. And then a big 50% saying I'm selective. I'm kind of trying it out. I'm seeing how it goes. And of course, the overall picture here is one of really an emergent marketplace for digital programming. People are discovering different kinds of program, digital programs. They're seeing what they like, what they don't like. Um, and there's just um, a world of possibility out there for them. Um, <clears throat> uh, the people, remember we said we're vulnerable to a serious health outcome. They're more likely to be actively looking for digital programming. You know, this is why digital programming is, is obviously so important in engaging uh, your most loyal patrons. Obviously digital programming can also engage new people and people who don't even live in your marketplace. And, and there's a lot of that uh, going on right now. Uh, but um, initially the people who are most loyal and the people who are most cautious about going out again are saying they're more engaged in digital content. Um, I just give you two examples. This is Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, this is uh, seven, seven deployment dates just for the Philadelphia Orchestra. They have been very active producing digital content. They have a digital stage platform where they're selling tickets to individual programs. I think they're charging $15. And they're going great guns with sales. Actually, we did some focus groups for them last couple of weeks ago, which was fascinating of people really explaining the role that digital programming will play in their life, even after live concerts come back. Um, but they just had very high percentages of their patrons saying, I'm actively watching out for digital programs and just compare that to the Nashville Symphony. They're not so active with digital programming. They're not producing digital programs like some others. And so, you know, 
This just says again that in our field, demand and supply have this unconventional relationship where supply actually catalyzes demand. And, and we can lead people into artistic experiences that maybe they would not necessarily choose. Um, all right, so moving on, like who's paying for digital content? We've sort of gotten into that a little bit. And we're seeing here uh, 40 to 50% the gray bars at the bottom of this chart are just people who did not watch in the last two weeks anything. The yellow bars are people who watched but did not pay. And the green bars are people who watched and paid. Now, I don't really have good time series data on this question, but I do believe these figures are going up slowly as the percentages of people who are learning to navigate paywalls, uh, learning to get comfortable with um, connecting through their, uh, through their home audio system or computers to um, platforms. Um, so a lot more to discover here. We asked people, how did you pay? If they paid, how did you pay? And most people are saying they're paying a one-time fee or making contributions. And I don't, I can't tell you which actually yields the most money. Maybe some of you know that from your own experience, but um, those are the two sort of dominant modalities. But a, sig a significant portion of people are also saying they're paying subscriptions for digital, um, or it's tied to a, a minimum annual contribution. I've also seen that. Um, don't have time to go into a lot of this, but we explore the idea of live streaming versus produced video content. Um, I was hearing a lot of assumptions, particularly in the orchestra field about, um, you know, we must fully produce our digital content within an inch of its life and, you know, provide something extremely high quality. And that's what we're going to do. And then we asked this question and actually, lo and behold, um, a third of people across most of our cohorts said, actually, I see value in a, in a live stream, in a true live stream, not pre-recorded, but the actual live. And we asked a follow-up question, what is that value? And people in their own words gave us beautiful value of live stream. It's happening once. If I, if I don't make it, I'll miss it. It gets on my calendar. It's an occasion. Um, and so this leads me to believe that actually a true live stream, which, you know, presumably with fixed cameras um, is, you know, is a product that some people want uh, because it's the real, for them, it's the real deal. It's, it's, it's next best thing to being there. Um, and it also gets on their calendar and it sort of fits in their life in, in a way that they're familiar with. Um, which is not to say that on demand, you know, produced videos available on demand are not an attractive product. Of course they are. But I just want to say that, that the live stream experience seems to be a value, uh, a value for some people. Um, so a lot of thinking here, um, you know, we're really, we really ought to be doing R&D as a field in terms of digital products and what their interest is and what their market potential is. You know, we're really in this sort of wild west now of digital programming. And we know there are different product lines that might be offered not by everyone, but by some. Um, and we just have a lot of work to do to, to figure out what's going to resonate, how to differentiate digital programs from live programs so that you actually get something different if you choose the digital. I mean, the focus groups last week were fascinating. People describe, of course, they're talking about watching Philadelphia Orchestra concerts, how, how they press the pause button and go back and listen to something again. And I just thought, I just thought it's fascinating, you know, how people, you can't do that in a concert hall, right? How, how people sort of take that experience and make it their own and actually find value in that. Uh, so I'll move on. Um, we had a little foray into this whole business of how are people set up at home to watch digital content. It's, it's just a 
topic that eats away at me because what we found out actually is a lot of people are sitting in front of computers that they normally work at and listening to orchestra concerts and operas through the speakers in their computer um, and having what might be termed suboptimal uh, audio experiences, if not visual. Um, so um, most people say, you know, they're giving at least partial attention or it depends, you know, um, so many people are watching digital content and not paying full attention. Um, interesting, I don't show you this cross tab, but older folks are way more likely to pay attention than younger folks. I shouldn't make any generalizations, should I? Oh, here it is actually, sorry, I do have that. There it is, folks. Uh, <laughs> so who's paying attention? Um, and then here is, is the setup. So, so the green bar, the, 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 the teal colored bars at the bottom are people who are watching on a computer using the computer speakers. Yellow bars are people who are watching on a television using the television's audio. Those are the dominant modalities of at-home setup. Um, younger folks are more likely to use mobile devices, but using the device's speakers, not connecting to an external audio. Anyway, um, to, to me, this is fascinating because if we really want to accomplish mission, through digital programming, I think at some point we have to deal with the quality of the experience on the recipient's end. Um, and just begin, we're setting new norms, establish, try to get people into the living room in front of the television where they normally watch movies, as opposed to sitting in front of their computer where they're multitasking. Um, and lo and behold, we did ask people if you need help upgrading your home audio visual system and um, not a lot of people, but more so older folks said yes, send the rescue team to my house. Um, and I thought that if I were an orchestra, I might actually be sending people around to homes for a small fee to upgrade their home audio uh, systems. All right, enough about that. Let's pivot to um, this uh, recent focus on vaccination. And then that um, naturally leads us to a discussion of sort of the next, next phase of research. So um, just before I start, I wanted to remind you of the sort of national picture here. This is from the Pew Research Center. Uh, their figures for the percentage of Americans who say they definitely or probably will get vaccinated have fluctuated wildly. Back in May, it was 72% saying they definitely would have, then it went way down to 50% back in September when we were in the throes of campaigning. Uh, figures bounced back to 60% uh, would get the vaccine, 39% would not. I imagine those figures have moved already potentially significantly, but uh, we don't know that for sure. So contrast that, you know, you're looking here, the last data point here was 39% saying they will not get vaccinated. For arts patrons, the figure is 2% to 8%. That's what we're seeing. Uh, in the Bay Area, it's 2% say I won't get vaccinated. Now, these are arts patrons. These are our most loyal arts patrons, the ones who take surveys, right? But, um, you know, this, this is uh, maybe a ray of light, finally, uh, that our constituents are, are really, after everything is said and done, very much want to get vaccinated at a very, very high percentage. Uh, so that, um, you know, I, I think is at least partially gratifying. Of course, what we have to be concerned about are success with vaccination in the general population because that will drive public policy when our venues open. Um, but this is what we're showing now. And um, 
Um, and there's been movement, dramatic movement here in these figures just since November. So I'm showing you here um, the last two uh, data collects from the Performing Arts Center on the left. Between December 16th and January 13th, the percentage of people who said they get vaccinated right away went from 46 to 67 percent. The next set three are our New York cohorts uh, from November, December, January, and you can see the pattern, right? So that just tells me that that attitudes about vaccination are so fungible. Um, and are changing. People are vulnerable to being influenced. They, by good information or by social reinforcement, whatever. Um, so even amongst our folks, there's been this dramatic shift in the last two months about feelings about vaccination. Now there's still people who are concerned about, about vaccination in one form or another. They wanna wait, they're in wait and see mode. Um, but I think the, the um, concerns over side effects, concerns over efficacy have diminished greatly already. Um, <clears throat> um, older folks are a little less hesitant to get vaccinated on average. Uh, which uh, I guess makes a little bit of sense. They are most vulnerable in general. Um, but here's a cross tab of this figure by race. Uh, this is from the Performing Arts Center cohort because we have just a very large number of cases. So we're able to cross tab and get stable results for African-Americans. And look, look at the results. That third column is, uh, is Black or African-American, 17% saying they'll get vaccinated right away compared to 49% for whites. Um, so, and that's within the arts audience. Um, so not, you know, not the general populations. There have been great studies of the general population which show similar results where there's a great deal of, of hesitancy uh, among certain groups of people for reasons that I'm sure many of us may be aware um, historical abuses. Um, so we, we, we have work to do even within our um, audiences, there is, is work to do. Um, but I wanted to share this with you. Um, and then uh, people who are more vulnerable to a serious outcome are a bit more likely to get vaccinated right away um, compared to others. So, um, <clears throat> The irony here <laughs> that we've been keeps us up at night is that the people who say that they're ready to go out as soon as it's legally permitted are least likely to want to get vaccinated. <laughs> um, so if you were to open your doors tomorrow, now I'm not so sure this is what this picture looks like in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but in the greater sort of arts audience in the US, you know, fully a quarter of the people who say they're ready to go out as soon as it's permitted are saying, I ain't getting vaccinated. Um, so we have, um, this brings up all sorts of interesting ethical and moral issues around um, requiring people to be vaccinated or, you know, I've seen some chat about certain commercial producers or presenters requiring vaccination proof it's a condition. Uh, I don't see that going well in our sector. Um, but we have people, there's a small but measurable contingent of people nationally who are opposed to vaccination for one reason or another um, and are ready to go out to the arts. Um, and then we have this quandary of a post-vaccination lag, um, which is people after they're vaccinated not being ready to go out yet. 
Uh, many people are, they say they will be ready to go out right away as soon as the vaccine takes effect in their bloodstream. Um, but large percentages say, I'm gonna wait to see how it goes. And just the more we think about this, um, there's gonna be this period of during the vaccination uh, campaign or rollout where, you know, even within the same household, some people are vaccinated, other people are not. Certainly within social groups, some will be vaccinated, others will be not. And so there's just gonna be this period of, of adjustment uh, where some people will be vaccinated and, and many others will not be, and people are just gonna wait. Um, so hopefully there won't be too many people who will wait a very long time, you know, but all of our data suggests that there are some people who just won't go out until there is no risk to them. Um, and of course, no risk is, you know, a mirage, right? Um, so here's the off-ramp, you know, we're here, um, we're in the middle of a terrible surge. You've experienced almost the worst of it with your neighbors down in LA, uh, but yet there are people who are ready to go out uh, as soon as it's permitted. Uh, we know there are people who will get vaccinated as soon as they can and be ready to go out if they could. Then we know people who will get vaccinated and wait. And we know there are people who will wait to get vaccinated a little while and then go out when they're ready. And then at the end of this, of course, the people who really just, you know, won't go out until there's no risk to them. And I, I honestly don't know what that satisfies their concern. I think it's a vaccination followed by an, an antibody test proving immunity. But right now we don't know if the antibody tests can be used to certify immunity after vaccination. I think that's still an open question. Um, but I do think there will be some people who will want, will need to go that far to, to before they're ready to go out again. Um, so that's, you know, the faster we get down this pathway, uh, the better. And, you know, it's just clear, at least in our country, unlike Australia and New Zealand, we're just not going to manage down COVID through good public health policies. That time has, has passed. And vaccination is our only ticket uh, in combination with uh, health safety measures that you all think about um, all day. Um, so, you know, all of this just leads me to kind of kind of wrap up and, and get to some of your questions and comments here of, of what can we do as a sector um, to contribute to discourse on, on health and risk and the effects of our decisions on others. I happen to think there's a lot we can do artistically and through our educational apparatus to contribute to this monumental public health challenge that stands before us right now, right? Our future as a sector depends on getting to herd immunity, not just in our theaters, but in our communities. Um, and so I, I provoke all of you, of course, I have to show Elvis Presley here, I wish I had other pictures of, uh, you know, other, other celebrities. Like I wish Liberace did a polio vaccine and I could show him here. But, um, <clears throat> you know, you can scan in your favorite celebrity here. And honestly, I do think celebrities will, will need to play a role in this because they're so influential in our culture. Uh, this might actually be something useful that some of the Kardashians could do is to advocate for vaccination. <laughs> but we as a sector obviously can go, you know, we can do things that PR and, and advertising can't do. Is we, can, we can raise up dialogue in our communities um, without being judgmental. And, and I think that's, that, that's what's going to be needed. So um, I just encourage you to 
think creatively and to, and to collaborate as much as you can. I, I know there are actually a number of theatrical works on uh, particularly one around the Tuskegee syphilis experiment and, and there are others on medical research. So I, I know there are artistic works out there and new ones to be created. Um, so that's an overview of everything. Obviously we turn the corner now and where I think we're going here is to, is to be in a position to closely monitor success with vaccination. So we're gonna see things move now. Uh, not right now, but in another couple of months. Um, and, and I think we wanna be in a position where we're able to say to our patrons, look at our great success, we're on track to get to 90% vaccination. And you know, or come, you know, whatever the numbers are, obviously, I don't know, April, May, June, where we can show people we're doing it and hopefully instill confidence that uh, it will be safer to come back to programs, to live programs. Um, so we're, we're planning very much on, on measuring uh, uptake on vaccination, attitudes about vaccination amongst those who've not yet been vaccinated, um, concerns post-vaccination. Um, you know, obviously you're all not in the healthcare business and we realize that, um, but I do think there's ways that we can communicate with our broad constituencies about some of these things. Um, in a way that instills confidence in the marketplace. Um, we'll also track uh, consumption of digital programs moving forward. There, there's just, just a world of research questions around, around digital that will you know, chip away, continue to chip away at. Um, that might actually become a separate study in itself. Um, but that's, uh, that's the update. So I'm gonna pop out a PowerPoint and just ask, um, ask you all to uh, send us your questions. I see there's a number of, um, of entries in the chat. Alan Klein, do you want to come on and um, yeah, um, tell us what we Thank got. you for that great overview. I've gotten questions in the chat as well as a few directly to me. Feel free to send them either way. Um, I wanted to start with the last ones we had, which were from Jennifer at ACT asking about the correlation in data that you showed between the Philadelphia Orchestra mm -hmm. and the Nashville Symphony around digital content. And were you saying that the Philadelphia Orchestra offered less digital content, meaning there was the lower demand that you- Well, the Nashville Symphony offered less, correct. Correct. And, and that's what you're saying, there's a correlation between less offered and less demand. Uh, yes. I think there's a very symbiotic and uh, untraditional relationship between supply and demand there. And she was also asking about the value of a live stream. Mm -hmm. And do we know if they would not watch digital programming if it was recorded, meaning they only want it live? Yeah, I, that I don't know. Um, I presume that some of those people would watch recorded, um, produced recordings. Um, but I, again, think this is really about product positioning and if a live stream is um, kind of approached as an entry level product, low cost, it's really uh, built, you know, it's a way of prospecting in a way um, to welcome more people into your, um, into your family. Um, but that, that's just my opinion on live streaming. I think I, I see it as a low cost entry point. And I'll add looking through a number of the qualitative responses we got around live streaming, we were seeing a number of different things that showed the value um, to different people, uh, which was different depending on who they are, but there was definitely a value to the feeling of community, even if you couldn't 
be with the people. You were still watching it at the same time as people. Some people wanted a chat function. Some people wanted to talk back. But the idea of I'm still part of a arts community was strong. Uh, there also were people who were talking about scheduling and saying, if it's one time, I'll actually do it. If it's there forever, I'll keep putting it off. Um, and there were other things as well, but those were two of the ones that stood out as to there are values to live stream that are uh, social and artistic in a way. Um, we, I got a question, uh, you alluded very briefly at the beginning to health safety um, and how we talked about that. Can you just give a few insights into what we saw in the early days around health safety? Um, sure. Um... You know, we ran uh, the long list of all the things that arts venues could do to make their venues safer from uh, enhanced sanitation procedures, obviously distancing, traffic flow, time, timed entry, uh, touchless transactions and all of that. And, and you know, hand sanitizer kind of rose to the top because I think everyone somehow deeply comforted by a bottle of hand sanitizer. But um, we just learned that sort of everything, people, you know, it's all important to people and, and people weren't, or at least the way we asked the question, people weren't really prioritizing specific health safety measures. We did some focus groups and people said, yeah, I trust, you know, I trust them to, figure out how to get it right logistically. Um, but, you know, these are such smart people. Our patrons are so informed and educated and they'll read lengthy blogs about ventilation systems and what makes one safer than another. So I think there's an element of the audience that actually wants a lot of information about health safety procedures and enforcement procedures. Uh, I just think it's gonna be so hard. There, there was an article in The Guardian, I think last week that showed a photograph of an audience at a theater company in Sydney, Australia. You know, it was right when the lights came up and like three quarters of the audience had their masks still on and a quarter had taken them off in the dark. And I just think it's gonna be so difficult to enforce that, um, even, even you know, not necessarily because people are are wanting to break the rules or they they just get uncomfortable or feel comfortable taking it off for one reason. So anyway, um, so all, all of that I think is going to be important. But but most people we're seeing are going are are happy to comply with whatever measures are necessary, right, Alan? If the, we have a question, if you have to wear a mask and adhere to distancing guidelines, will you still go out? And, and I, the, the percentage of people who answer yes, or maybe, uh, is very, very high. And has actually increased a bit more as the vaccination uh -huh. come out. Um, we had a couple of questions around the upcoming protocol. Um, Karen McKevitt was asking about uh, measuring reactions and attitudes about virus variants and how they might impact vaccination efficacy. Are people more wary uh, given the potential variants in the vaccine? Uh, do we see the same confidence in vaccination yeah. being previously? Yeah, I think th this is great. I mean, this news about variants and the extent to which the vaccines are are efficacious against the variants, you know, is just coming out. And I think this is another reason that people will wait after being vaccinated. Um, also, people wonder how long their immunity will last, and that that's going to become an issue really within months of people being vaccinated. They're gonna wonder when they need to be vaccinated again, maybe. Um, there are people concerned that even though they're vaccinated, they still might be carrying the virus and would not go out because of that. 
So I just think there are a lot of questions for that for some people will will be serious enough that they won't go out. Um, and it'll there will be a gradual, hopeful, <laughs> as we learn more, a gradual lifting of, of those concerns. And we've had a couple of great questions from Joe Manley, one about uh, if there are questions to suggest and Brad put his email in and I wanted to share that with everyone. If there are questions you wanna to talk to us about, uh, feel free to get in touch. But there was also a question about doing further survey, surveying on acceptance and eagerness for virtual programming and what mm -hmm. our plans are regarding digital content moving forward. Yeah, um, great, you know, great topic. We're always thrilled to have suggestions. Um, and um, it's just such a huge topic. Um, and, and honestly, we need to be in the R&D space where we're piloting, we're designing virtual programs, piloting them at a low cost, testing them. You know, the R&D work we never do on our main stage programming. <laughs> uh, because we, you know, we just don't know necessarily what's gonna resonate. So this, this is the time to be doing co mostly qualitative research um, and to try a lot different pricing schemes, different you know, platforms, um, but we gotta work together to figure this out. We can't all try to do it ourselves. It's just not gonna, it's not gonna work that way. And I will uh, say that we have been doing qualitative work and we will be releasing some of that both our research uh, to tell you about, but also uh, suggestions and protocol for doing your own research on our audienceoutlookmonitor.com website um, in the next couple of months. I'll put that URL in the chat, um, but do keep in touch. And if you're not on our email list to hear more updates from Alan Brown, you can join our email list there. I have one more question I want to ask you, Alan, before we get going, um, which was about age. We know the pandemic affects people at different age groups. Have there been any additional variations that you've seen in the data based on age of respondents? Well, there's um, interesting uh, discussion about uh, women of childbearing age being concerned about vaccination. I think we're seeing some of that in our data. Um, so, um, small percentage, but it is yeah. you know, five percent higher than yeah. None. So that that's that's the one um, other exception. Great, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for joining us and sharing all of your questions. Um, if you have additional questions, please always feel free to reach out to us. One of the goals of this project has been to make this data as accessible as we can and help the field grow in general. Um, Kim has helpfully uh, posted a Google form so that we can send you the recording and slide deck. Um, so please do keep in touch. And as we figure out the next stage of this, we'll be in touch with Brad who will be spreading uh, the information out to the Bay Area at large so we can keep sharing what we're learning in this absolutely unbelievable time. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate so much you taking the time out of your busy day to uh, listen in and hang in there and uh, hope, to, hope to see you all soon. Take care. And thank you to Brad and everyone at Theater Bay Area for making all this possible. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.